All right, this video is kind of a bonus video. It's a cool aspect of physics that I wanted to talk about. We've already mentioned it. But originally, when we were first drawing up these lesson plans, I wasn't even going to talk about this because a pretty good chunk of this particular topic has to do with scripting. And so scripting is outside the scope of what we're discussing throughout uh, Unity Fundamentals here. And so I wasn't even going to talk about this at all. And then I started realizing and kind of playing with it and thinking, well, you can still kind of show it and at least set up a basic example. And of course, what I'm talking about is our final type of collider, and that is a wheel collider. Right. We can't make an example without scripting that's going to look like something in a triple A racing game. But we can give you something that looks like something you may have done in Cub Scouts. And well, we can show you how the wheel collider works. Uh, we can give you a rundown of its properties so that you can play with them. And if you move on and start actually creating the necessary scripts to create a driving game using this system, you're going to have to go through these steps anyway, or at least something very similar, in order to set up a car. So we'll at least get that out of the way. Now, that said... Again, a wheel collider, as you've already gathered, is a special collider that is just here to handle things like car wheels or anything that is, you know, like wheeled vehicle based, that sort of uh, that sort of thing. Now, we also mentioned earlier that all of the really cool stuff is exposed through script. I'll talk more about what is exposed through script here in just a moment. Before I do that, I want to throw out just some general warnings. There are some things that the wheel collider will do and some things that it will not do. The wheel collider will, so it will do these things. It will calculate friction, both forward and sideways. So if, if this is our wheel, we can calculate forward friction as well as sideways friction if you need the tire to slide. It can calculate suspension. So it'll actually detect when you're in contact with the ground, and if you hit it too hard, it'll push back up off the ground, just like the suspension on a real car. Now, these are the are some things that it can do right out of the gates, things that we don't really need scripting in order to access, things that we'll actually be playing with a little bit right here in this video. There are some other things that it will do that are scripting only, and that includes things like uh, controlling motor torque, and everything I'm writing down now are variables that are actually exposed in script that you can directly access should you need to. Uh, brake torque, if you want to slow down. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but, you know, I guess it could be handy at some point. Uh, steer angle. If you want to take the front tires and turn them left and right to actually make it look like you're steering. And then some read-only uh, properties as well. Uh, so you can tell if the tire is grounded or a wheel, you know, however you want to put it. And you can gauge what the RPMs are. And that's, that's information that can be fed back to you. And all of these that I've written off here are accessible only through script, so we won't be exploring those. Now, that's a list of the things that the Wheel Collider can do. Now, there's some things that it can't do as well. So I'll kind of mark off a little area here. Can't do. The wheel collider is not responsible for spinning your wheels. And by spinning, I mean the actual wheel models. So let's write that. Spinning the wheel models. It's not responsible for turning your wheel models either. So when we set up this example, our wheels are... Re you can just think of them as representations of where wheels should generally be, and that's about it. They're not going to turn as, w as the car moves forward. They're not going to turn left and right because we don't have any steering system in place anyway. And it also, you're not going to see the wheels move up and down along with the suspension. That's going to be something that would be handled through explicit scripting. You would tell a tire exactly how to behave based on the information fed back from these variables. Right. Basically, the wheel collider will do all the calculations, and it will keep your car elevated like there were tires there. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't animate or move anything of or any of your game objects apart from moving the car through the world as if it was rolling. That's right. Now, let's jump into Unity and let's set up a really basic example using the wheel collider. So first off, I guess I need to build a car. 
So let's jump over here into the hierarchy panel, and I'll create a cube. And I'm going to immediately rename this cube Car Body. It's the most advanced car body ever. I'm already in licensing talks with, uh, with Ferrari over this design. So there's our amazing car body. Now, I'd also like to make some, uh, some wheels. Once again, the wheels are really just going to be kind of generic representations of where wheels should be with this car and really nothing more. So let's just start off by creating a cylinder. So pop in a cylinder, and I'm going to name this. I'm going to try to name this properly because we've already uh, established in an earlier video that unfortunately we didn't get a chance to keep uh, that I don't know my left from my right especially when I'm recording. It's something about the pressure. So let's say LF for left front tire. And because I want this to be the front of my car, I'm actually saying it. Let's make the little L symbol with my left hand. There we go. Perfect. And we'll slide that forward. Now I'm going to rotate this on Z to make it look a little bit more tire-like. So we'll rotate that 90 degrees. Let's rescale it a bit. And we can scale it up. Now, because this will not actually be moving, this will just be part of a static object, both it and its collider can interpenetrate into our car. It'd be a different story if we were handling this like a an actual car setup where the wheel was a free rolling, kind of freestanding thing. If we had interpenetrations then, we could run into some severe problems. In fact, in most cases, it'd probably be simpler not to have the wheels themselves collide at all. Right. And, it, and at that point, if you wanted to have a destructible tire, you wouldn't want to use a sphere collider on it. No, no. This is a little odd. But really, this is just for demonstration purposes and just to give us some sort of representation of where a tire can it should be, so that'll work. Now, I'm starting to get multiple objects here, and I'd like to keep things a little better organized here in my hierarchy view. So I'm going to hit Control-Shift-N to create a new empty game object, which I'm going to simply name Car. I'll parent my car body to the car by dragging on top of it, and I'll take the left front tire and I'll do the same thing. And we'll expand that. I'll grab my left front tire, and let's hit Control D. And let's uh, make sure that everything is kind of dead center, so I'll select my car. And you see how my pivot point for a car object is kind of off to the side here? So let's grab the car body object, and I'll zero everything out. And this will just be important later on, because if I want to move the car, you'd expect the pivot to be right in the middle of the car. And, well, it wouldn't be otherwise. So now let's grab the left front tire, and I'll position that kind of close to where our left front tire should be. It doesn't have to be precise, and you can make it up on every different car you make. Now, let's, uh, I'm going to take this duplicated tire, because I didn't move them together, and I'll just reduplicate it for simplicity's sake. We'll just hit Control-D, and I'll slide this guy back in the Z-axis and rename this left rear tire, or just LR. And this is the left side of the car, so things are going well so far. I'm, I'm actually quite pleased. Now, let's grab left and right together and hit Control-D, and I'll slide these over to the other side of the car. They don't have to be even, but I like to get them at least relatively close. So let's say that works for now. And let's just rename these to right front tire and right rear tire. So RF and RR. Now, I like to have a little bit of extra organization in here, so I'm going to grab all four of these and put them under their own game objects. Let's hit Control-Shift-N one more time. And we'll just call this Tire Models. I think I just put Model Singular, so let's make that plural. Now, just one more time. I just want to drive it home so there's no confusion. These tires that you see here, they will not spin, they will not rotate with steering, they will not jump up and down with suspension. They're just going to sit there statically and slide along with the car. Now, at this point, we need to bring in our wheel colliders, and the wheel colliders are what are going to do all the work and make this little contraption we've put together behave similarly to an actual car. However, you might be thinking in the back of your head, well, that should be no problem. Let's just grab one of the tires and drop on a wheel collider. Well, you could do that. It'll be problematic, and let's show you why. Let's go under Component, jump under Physics, and grab Wheel Collider. And we get a little warning. Would you like to replace or add? Let's choose Add, and check it out. 
Our wheel collider is there, but it's in the middle of the tire, it's turned sideways, and it's too small. That's because it's trying to match the rotation and scale of the object that it was attached to, and that's a problem. Not to mention we already have a collider in place, and as a general rule of thumb, you should try to only have one collider per game object. So let's go ahead and remove that. What we're going to do instead is create an empty game object that I'm going to name left front or LF collider, and I'm going to parent this to my car object. Now currently, this game object is just empty. It has nothing in it. What I'm going to do is go under Component, we'll go under Physics, and drop on a wheel collider. Now, as soon as it comes in, you'll see it's oriented properly with its little suspension vector, which is this line you see in here, pointed down toward the ground. That's good. That's where you want that to be pointed. And it comes in with a size which is much more manageable. However, we need this to be aligned with the appropriate tire and we need to adjust its size accordingly. Now uh, let me go ahead and get these aligned first and then I'll take a look at all of the properties that are available underneath the wheel collider. So we'll start off by taking our LF collider game object and I'm just going to parent it to the left front tire. We're not going to leave it that way. I just want to make sure everybody understands that. I'm just using this as a trick to get everything nice and centered up. So we can take LF collider now and zero out its transform position. And you'll see now it's nicely lined up. Actually, the size is working pretty well, too. It's good to have a little bit of an extra pillow, especially if there's already some sort of a collider there that we could be conflicting with, and you're following along with me. Now, let's grab our LF collider and hit Control D, and I'll rename this to LR collider. And once again, just as a trick for alignment purposes, I'm going to parent this to LR tire and then zero out its transforms. And it moves over like so. And we'll select that and duplicate it. We'll rename this right front tire, or I'm sorry, right front collider, excuse me. And we'll parent that to the right front tire, again zeroing out the transforms. So it moves that into position as well. And then finally we'll take our right front collider and duplicate it, renaming it right rear parent that to the tire and zero that out as well. So now we have everything established and aligned. At this point we could actually hit play if we wanted to and we, we would see a result. So let's take a quick look at that because that's actually kind of fun. But first I just want to show you the hierarchy and I want to actually, before I hit play, I want to mention this earlier. I, I said earlier I didn't want to leave my colliders parented to my tires. So let me make sure I fix that before I do anything else. Uh, I'm going to create an empty game object that will contain these. We will name this game object Tire Colliders. I'm sorry, I'm so excited to hit play and see this thing roll that I'm just getting a little bit ahead of myself. So let's parent this up underneath our car. Now I'm going to take all four of my colliders all at the same time and drag those right on top of tire colliders. And now here's a quick look at the hierarchy. We have our main car object. We have our car body, which is just the, the little box that defines the shape of our car body. If I jump down, we have our tire models, all parented under a single game object. These are just representations of where tires could be. If you're building your own uh, racing car game, you will not have your tires parented directly into the car. And if you did for some reason, you'd want to make sure that they were behaving accordingly based on that tire's position. We're just leaving them kind of statically bound, and that's generally not what you're going to do. And then we have a game object containing all of our tire colliders. Now, the Does anything have to be a rigid body on this? I was actually going to say, the last thing we have to do is to create a rigid body, which I'm going to do at the level of our car. So if I collapse everything down, just with our car selected, I can go to Component, Physics, and drop on Rigid Body. And once again, there's Lee looking out for me like he always does. Let's put a little bit of mass on here, just on basic principle. We don't need much. In fact, it's going to be a pretty light car. And then for the fun of it, I'm going to make sure that we're kind of lined right up with that tree dead ahead of us. We'll slide this back a little bit, pick it up into the air, and let's hit play and just see what we get. And we start rolling. And we bang into the tree. We have a simple car system. Now, a few things that you should know about this, just to illustrate some of the points I brought up earlier, that this is not really behaving like a true car, I'm going to take my game view 
and I'm going to dock it to the right hand side so I can see both of these at the same time. I'm going to take my scene view and set it over to wireframe mode. And then I'm going to expand this out and make sure that I have at least one of the tire models selected. In fact, let's grab right front because that's the nearest to us. And I'll just rotate the view so we can see that. Pay close attention to the wires of the actual tires. As I hit play, you'll see they hit the ground and they're just sliding. The overall behavior of the car is such that as if we had four tires which were rolling forward. But the model itself isn't behaving accordingly. Once again, I'm just driving that home as hard as I can. That would all have to be handled through script. Okay, so with all of that in place and understood, let's take a quick look at the properties of a wheel collider. All right, so let's jump up here to our tire colliders. I, I want to call them tire colliders now because that's what I named them. So let's start with just the, the left front. It doesn't really matter which one we select, and I'll make sure I'm in the scene view, and I'll set that back over to textured so that things are nice and visible because this will be important here in just a moment. Now, starting from the top, we have our center. This allows us to create an offset for our wheel should we need to. We can move it in any one of the given axes just like we could the other types of colliders we had access to, but since I have already aligned these, they're right where they need to be. Now, I also uh, could scale them a little bit. I didn't need to. I was lucky in that these kind of lined up pretty much right where I wanted them to, but if you need to increase or decrease the radius of these wheel colliders, you can do that. Just be careful if you're following along with this tutorial for some reason, you're, you're trying to get the exact same result that I have. If your radius is smaller than the radius of the actual uh, wheel models themselves, then you won't get any rolling. Why is that, Lee? Well, what happens is the capsule collider will hit the ground first, and it'll prevent the uh, the wheel colliders from ever coming in contact with the ground. Right. Wheel colliders don't touch the ground, they don't roll. That's right. Now, if you wanted to solve this problem, you could completely get rid of the capsule colliders that are on these cylinders. The only thing about that is if, you know, you're actually playing with this and you expect that wheel to knock something out of the way, like if you put like a box in its path, you got to have something there. A wheel collider does not push geometry out of its way. A wheel collider's only job is to handle the relationship between your car and the road surface it happens to be driving on. That is it and that is all. So if you're hoping that that tire will knock over a box or, or push a character out of the way, no dice. That's not what it's there for. So now with that understood, let's get back over to the wheel collider, which I think I need to undo a couple of things so I can get that radius back to where it was. And there we are. Now this brings us down to suspension distance. And suspension distance is shown right here in the view as this little vector that is pointing straight down toward the ground. You need this to point straight down to the ground because which you're going to be driving on the ground. Right, which is why you do not want to take a wheel collider and parent it to the object that is your tire that you're going to be rotating. Because if you were to do that, you're going to rotate your wheel collider and it's not going to be pointing at the ground. That's right. This little ray, if you will, is used to figure out whether or not we need to start pushing back up off the ground. And that's handled with a couple of different things. First off, with your suspension distance. And as I increase this, you'll see that line getting longer and longer and longer. If that line penetrates the ground, you are compressing your suspension. You can think of this line as being the length of your your shock absorber, if you will, when it's completely extended out as far as it can possibly go. If, if I'll try to get my camera to where it's kind of like right on the ground, even if it penetrates through, that's actually okay a little bit. If I was to increase this distance so it goes down through the ground, as soon as I hit play, Unity is going to detect that this uh, suspension system has been compressed down and it needs to extend back to its original uh, its original distance which means we should be picking this wheel up off the ground however this works in tandem with your suspension spring property to control how hard you're pushing if you don't have enough force with the spring it's just gonna compress and it won't actually fight back at all so let's just start off by hitting play and that's already enough force because we don't have a whole lot of mass in our car if I was to really crank up the mass, it might be such that it just squashes that down. But just to make a, an easy demonstration of it, if I take my spring and set its strength to something really low, like 0 .001, we get pretty much nothing from that. It just kind of falls straight down. 
But as soon as we have any spring tension to speak of, Unity detects that we have compressed our suspension and it tries to extend it up. Now, why is this visually confusing? It's visually confusing because we're not actually seeing the wheels move. And so I'm just going to keep reminding you that those wheels are just kind of a generic representation of, uh, of the actual compression itself. So let's pull that back down and let's talk a little bit more about our spring properties. Now you've already seen how our spring coefficient, as it's called on the tooltip, that's the strength of your spring. That's how hard Unity is going to push back to make sure that when you compress that, when, when this vector, your spring uh, distance penetrates through the ground, that's how hard you're going to push back to get that line back up out of the ground again. Next you have damper. This is just a way to soften that motion. If you're getting a uh, wild velocity, when you like if you jump your car and it lands out on the road and it's pushing up way too quick, you can apply some damping to the spring and that will, it's kind of like a resistive motion on that back push. And that's true of, uh, it's, it's exactly the same thing as the damper on an actual spring constraint, which, uh, or a spring joint, which is something we'll talk about a little bit later. And then finally we have our target position. And this is going to be the position that we're going to try to... Uh, the target position is a way that you can map the value of the current... Uh, the value of the suspension somewhere along your suspension distance. So earlier on I told you that the suspension distance you can think of as the length of the suspension when it's fully extended. And you gotta, it helps if you think about it like a car shock. So hopefully you're all at least relatively familiar with the, uh, an actual shock of a car. Because if we take our suspension distance and we were to set it up to, a, let's say, a value like 5, this target position allows us to determine what our at-rest position is along that distance. A value of 0 is fully extended, and that's pretty much how any car is actually going to work, because a, a car tries to push that, uh, that shock absorber back out to its full extension. It's fought by the weight of the car and by the tires jumping up when you hit a bump. If we slide this out to 1, and it's technically supposed to be just a 0 to 1 value, a value of 1 maps this to fully compressed suspension, which means our at-rest length would be all the way back up here. Really, this would get rid of your suspension. You wouldn't have any anymore. If we set this to, say, 2.5, I'm sorry, uh, just 0.5, excuse me. I was thinking 2.5 because that would be our result up here. That would be halfway along our suspension distance. So that would be like saying that the rest position of our suspension, the rest position of the spring that's driving our tire sits at halfway along this length. That could help us move up and down to get a little bit of, of springiness. The problem is that in a real car, that springiness, that up and down feel when you jump up and down like on the, the bumper of a car, comes from the fact that you have a spring which is uh, starts off fully extended and then the weight of the car starts to crush it down. So if I was to try to make this a little easier with a little bit of, uh, of whiteboarding, let me just clear myself off a little area here. This would be our suspension distance. And your suspension system is always going to try to push back to this distance whenever it can. That's how it works. Uh, if this, uh, and we've already seen that vector, once it kind of penetrates underneath the ground, it starts to push back to push the car back up into the air and that is in turn extending your suspension back out. That's because by default your rest position, meaning your, let me just go back into the actual property itself, the actual target position by default is set to zero, which would be down here. A target position of one is up here. You can think of it as where your car should be riding along the, the length of your suspension. If we set this to 0 0.5, then our car would ride halfway along that suspension height. It's something you can play with, but for most cars, you're generally just going to leave this mapped out to zero. Now, let's go back over into Unity. We have just a few things left. We have mass, so we can set that on each individual wheel if we want to, uh, and that can fight against the actual mass of the overall car itself. Uh, to to help uh, if you you know you jump the car and you know, the individual mass of the tires might be an in, uh, important factor in the air or you know how how quickly they're going to jump up into the air versus come back down controls all of their physical forces really now then we get over into friction and this is where we start having to talk about some serious math stuff 
which I'll be the first one to admit I'm not a complete master of, but I can explain to you how this works. Let's jump over to Photoshop. And let me clear off a little area here. What we're looking at are the friction settings. Now these are both exactly the same for the time being. We have control over forward friction and sideways friction. If we want the car to have different behavior uh, in terms of friction when it's sliding sideways versus when it would be sliding forward, all we have to do is set up two different values here. But if you see this kind of stuff for the first time, you might be wondering, you know, what does all of this stuff mean? What is the extremum? What is the asymptote? These allow you to map out a graph of friction, which if you don't work on cars and don't play with tires or you haven't played a whole lot of uh, car simulators like Forza or Gran Turismo, you might have never seen these before. But to, to do a gross oversimplification of the situation, if we make a graph of the amount of slip versus the amount of torque applied to a tire, we have two points, two important points that we can map out. We have the highest amount of torque we can have before we pretty much maximize our slip, or as slip increases, you can see our, our torque is increasing as well. And then, as our torque starts to bleed back down, we would still continue slipping, and then this would level out. It's just the way that, uh, that traction seems to go. And you can see this in a real car. If you have a car that is powerful enough where you can break the drive wheel free, and I'm not recommending you do this. You can actually get a ticket in most states if you happen to be in the U.S. Uh, but if you do uh, hit your accelerator so hard that your tire lets go, you'll find that as you start to lay off the throttle, you're still going to keep slipping. There's that critical point where your tire breaks free and starts sliding, but then as you start to bring down the force, it's still going to slide until you get back to a second critical point, and then you're, you're back. You can start uh, driving once again with an amount of slip that remains constant throughout. Now, these two points are known as the extremum and the asymptote. Asymptote. That was horrible spelling on my part. Now, I am not going to tell you exactly what settings you're going to use for each one of these. Dep it's going to depend on a lot of different factors. Uh, if you take a look at the Unity forums, there are a lot of different examples that people have thrown out that seem to work good for, uh, to work well for various uh, types of situations. But I will mention that uh, what we basically what we've got here is the ability to map out. Uh, the position of each one of these points and then what their value is going to be. So you're literally drawing that curve. And then you have a stiffness factor. And that stiffness factor you can think of as controlling your overall amount of slip. This is something you'll generally control in script, actually. As your car goes from a street surface to a dirt surface, your traction is going to change. And as you increase this value, you can increase the amount of slip on your tire. So that's something that you would technically be modifying through script. I realize it's very technical. I'm n I don't pretend to be a pro over how uh, torque versus slip is actually you know mapped out on a on a uh, a real tire, but that's uh, the basis of how it works. So that is a rundown of our wheel collider. We just made a very very simple car, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and pull my uh, suspension distance back down to something a little bit more rational. And then we'll go ahead and hit play once again so we can see that roll forward. And I realize it's probably not the most exciting example in the world, but it does allow you to see this collider in motion. And if you would like to make your own uh, car game, it's a great place to start. But unless you had any questions, Lee. No, not really. All right. Well, that is going to wrap things up for this video. Thanks for watching.